Einstein did, in effect, was simply to remove God from the picture and to substitute in his place a finite observer. According to historian of science Gerald Holton, thus the relativity <coughs> theory merely shifted the focus of space-time from the sensorium of Newton's God to the sensorium of Einstein's abstract Gedanken experimenta, as it were, the final secularization of physics. By rejecting Newton's absolute time and space, and along with them, the ether, relativity theory left behind only their empirical measures. Since these are relativized to inertial frames, one ends up with the relativity of simultaneity and of length. What justification did Einstein have for so radical a move? How did he know that absolute time and space do not exist? The answer, in a word, is verificationism. Historians of science have demonstrated convincingly that at the philosophical roots of Einstein's theory lies a verificationist epistemology mediated to the young Einstein through the influence of Ernst Mach, which comes to expression in Einstein's analysis of the concepts of time and space. In 1905, when Einstein published his paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, and for several years thereafter, he was a self-confessed epistemological pupil of Mach, and the epistemological analysis of space and time, given in the opening sections of this paper, clearly displays this influence. Mach's positivism manifests itself most clearly in Einstein's a priori rejection of absolute time and space and reliance on operational definitions of crucial concepts. Absolute time, or a privileged frame, is presumed not to exist because, quote, to the concept of absolute rest, there correspond no properties of the phenomena, end quote. It is taken for granted that, quote, all our judgments in which time plays a role must have a physical meaning. When it comes to judgments concerning the simultaneity of distant events, the concern is to find a practical arrangement to compare clock times. In order to define a common time for spatially separated clocks, we assume that the time light takes to travel from A to B is equal to the time it takes to travel from B to A, a definition which presupposes that absolute space does not exist. Thus, time is reduced to physical time, clock readings, and space to physical space, readings of measuring rods. And both of these are relativized to local frames. Simultaneity is defined in terms of clock synchronization via light signals. All of this is done by mere stipulation. Through Einstein's operational definitions of time and space, Mach's positivism triumphs in the special theory of relativity. Reality is reduced to what our measurements read. Newton's metaphysical time and space, which transcend operational definitions, are implied to be mere figments of our imagination. In Einstein's other early papers on relativity, his verificationist theory of meaning comes even more explicitly to the fore. Concepts which cannot be given empirical content and assertions which cannot be empirically verified in principle are discarded as meaningless. In his article, in the Jahrbuch der Radioaktivität und Elektronik of 1907, after giving his operational definitions for time and simultaneity, he asserts that to refer to the time of an event without reference to its inertial frame has no sense, Zinn. In his piece, in the Physikalische Zeitschrift of 1909, he asserts that statements about the time of an event have no meaning, bedeutung, unless one refers to clocks at rest in the relevant inertial system. In his summary paper, the Relativitätstheorie, published in 1911, Einstein expresses himself at greater length concerning the meaning of statements about time and space. He says, and I think I have a quotation of this. No. Um, 
He says, in order to arrive at time specifications of a very precise sense, we use a prescription that relates to clocks, which are re in, uh, relative to a certain coordinate system, K. We have not gained simply a time, he says, but a time relative to a coordinate system. Quote, it is not said that time has an absolute meaning. That is an arbitrary element which was contained in our kinematics. We then come, Einstein proceeds, to the second arbitrary element in kinematics, the absolute length of a body. Quote, we now ask, how long is this rod? This question can only have the meaning, what experiments must we carry out in order to discern how long the rod is, end quote. Einstein then proceeds to describe length measurements of a moving rod by means of synchronized clocks. By abandoning the presuppositions of absolute time and space and substituting in their stead operational definitions, Einstein reduces time and space to our measurements of them. He concludes, quote, since we have in a precise way physically defined coordinates and time, every relation between spatial and temporal entities will have a very precise physical content, end quote. Statements about spatial or temporal relations which are metaphysical in character, that is, are independent of clocks, rods, and reference frames, are nonsense. It is frequently asserted that as Einstein labored on the general theory, he came to see the bankruptcy of Mach's positivism. But this claim needs to be carefully qualified. What Einstein's work on GTR, in fact, revealed to him was the inadequacy of Mach's phenomenalism. Scientific theorizing is not the mere linking of observation statements, but involves a creative exercise of the mind, which is free to postulate theoretical entities not directly given in observation. Nevertheless, even after GTR, he continued to regard such theoretical terms as meaningless unless they could somehow be linked to observation statements. In 1920, for example, he writes, we thus require a definition of simultaneity such that this definition supplies us with the means by which, in the present case, he can decide by experiment whether the lightning strokes occurred simultaneously. As long as this requirement is not satisfied, I allow myself to be deceived as a physicist. And, of course, the same applies if I am not a physicist, when I imagine that I am able to attach a meaning to the statement of simultaneity. For physicists and non-physicists alike, the statement that two events occur simultaneously is meaningless unless an operational definition can be given for that concept. Thus, he continued to cling to his rejection of metaphysical space and time. He says, the only justification for our concepts and system of concepts is that they serve to represent the complex of our experiences. Beyond this, they have no legitimacy. I am convinced that the philosophers have had a harmful effect upon the progress of scientific thinking in removing certain fundamental concepts from the domain of empiricism, where they are under our control to the intangible heights of the a priori. For even if it should appear that the universe of ideas cannot be deduced from experience by logical means, but is, in a sense, a creation of the human mind without which no science is possible, nevertheless, this universe of ideas is just as little independent of the nature of our experiences as clothes are of the form of the human body. This is particularly true of our concepts of time and space, which physicists have been obliged by the facts to bring down from the Olympus of the a priori to adjust them and put them in a serviceable condition. Einstein's theory, far from disproving the existence of absolute space, actually presupposes its non-existence. All of this is done by mere stipulation. Reality is reduced to what our measurements read. Newton's metaphysical time and space, which transcend operational definitions, 
are implied to be mere figments of our imagination. 